So uh, I'm reading from the uh, ESV, so it might be a little bit different uh, in the King James. It says, uh, after this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila at Sanfrei, he had cut his hair for it. He was under a vow, and they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he himself went to the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a little longer for a, for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. So this is really after um, they had a looked like they had a um, little uh, skirmish and um, be, well this was after the fact. Well yeah, this was after they had a skirmish. Um, the Jews rose, they got jealous of uh, Paul. And the Jews rose up and uh, they took him to They took him to Gal uh, Galileo, um, and they wanted, I guess they wanted Paul to get in trouble. Um, they wanted, uh, ooh, let me catch myself. They, um, they basically, because of their jealousy toward Paul, they, um, let's just finish the text, because my, my thought's not, not coming. So, I really want to, um, Get into verse 21. It said, but on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail to Ephesus. So the first point with that that really like stood out to me is who really lives like that? Like who of us actually lives their life like that? To where it's not like I make my own plans. It's not like um, when I decide to go do this and that, I decide. Mm -hmm. Do we actually bring God in on our plans daily and future tense? Um, I do, for the most part, but a lot of times um, I'm lacking with this aspect. Because a lot of times I do what I want to do. And Paul was and his text Paul is different than that. Like, and it just blows my mind. Like, even they asked if he was going to return, and he could have said, "Sure, just need your reaction." Not even thinking about it, he could have said, "Yeah, I'm going to return, and this is what I'm going to do." But this—that's not what he did. He—he uh, he said, "If the Lord wills," and it just amazes me that Paul was thinking that way. Like, you know it. All I can think about is Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And he said, uh, not my will, but thine. Mm -hmm. And that's literally like kind of like the mantra or like the thesis statement of our life that we should have. Like, it's not about what I want to do. And it's completely contradictory to, or, at the, or yeah, to what the world would tell us to do because it's all about follow your dreams, follow your passions, um, do what you want to do. Right. And that's really not, that's really anti-biblical. Because um, our steps should be led by the Holy Spirit. Right. And unfortunately, that's like, that's not what the world teaches. That's not ideology that you hear um, out here. You don't hear that. You hear, um, you know, follow your passions, do, do what makes you happy. And that, that's, that's a dangerous one because, like, you know, what, what makes me happy makes you not. And is, is that, you know, is that okay? Of course not. Like, an individual, they would never do what makes you happy. Nobody would ever really, like, if you really thought that through, nobody would ever really agree with that. Because sometimes what makes you happy might be to leave your family and your kids and leave your wife or your husband and do everything 
because you want to find her. I just thought about uh, <laughs> I ain't gonna say no names, but uh, I know an individual who left and uh, pursued a rap career. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and left uh, an individual to like fend for the children by themselves. Um, it's a true story, and uh, blow my mind. But if you follow in like today's ideology and ideas, like that's something that you know would be normal to you, and you wouldn't even think you wouldn't even you wouldn't even think twice about it. He didn't think twice about it. He just did it. Um, you know. So verse twenty two, he says, so when he landed in uh, Caesarea. He went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. Mm -hmm. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Persia, strengthening all the disciples. When you hear about Paul, you, mo you mostly hear about his missionary journeys. You mostly hear about Paul preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. But you never really hear a lot about him disciple. But throughout really Acts, and you can see throughout the New Testament, really all the letters that he wrote was really a means of discipling like churches that he started and planted. Right. But in like Acts, the, the, emphasis, the emphasis is more on him evangelizing. Sometimes in the Christian, well, in and particularly in the Christian church, we do that sometimes. We overemphasize evangelism, and sometimes we can minimize discipleship. And both are important because once, what happens after somebody comes to Christ? They have to get discipled. So, you know, of course, evangelism is extremely important. But discipleship is it's, I would say um, somebody getting saved is at the top, obviously, because you want them to be saved so that they can spend eternity with Jesus. But, you know, that's um, it's such thing as sanctification also. You know, you, you, you can be, you're justified, then you're sanctified. And you have to, be, you know, sanctified is being, um, being saved while you're here. It's not that you're not already saved, but you being cleansed, you uh, you growing as a Christian. Um, certain things you putting down, other things you putting up. You putting off sin, and you picking up uh, Christian principles, reading the Bible, um, whatever the Bible says, uh, loving your neighbor, um, loving one another, uh, giving. Um, all of these different Christian principles you picking up, a lot of the sinful practices you putting down, and it's important. I don't want to say it's as important as evangelism. I don't want to say it's as important as being saved, but it, it is important, and sometimes it can be minimized. But when we see Paul here, you know, it was important for Paul to go back to a lot of the churches that he planted and. Or either write to the churches that he planted, and make and make he wanted to make sure that they were grown. He wanted to make sure that they had the proper instruction um, to grow their body, and that's what I see him doing um, in this verse 20, uh, 22. He really he it says strengthening all of the disciples. So he didn't just you know yeah they were disciples, so they were already evangelized, but he went back to strengthen them. And I think that's something that we should strive to do also. Like, yes, absolutely, evangelize. Absolutely, evangelism is at the top, but discipleship is right after that. Um, he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Um, yeah, evangelize, but also teach them. It's not just evangelize to them and just leave them there. Um, it's important to, be, to continue in that uh, discipleship. And here, Paul's the one, but we all are responsible, every Christian, not just the pastor, 
or you know the elders or whoever that's in charge the leadership but it's also each and every Christian each one's each one and we all have a measure of faith and we all we all are saved we, we should be um, and the ones that are saved we should be teaching the ones that just got saved to get to where we are and and it's, sometimes it's not even I'm at a higher level than you it might be an aspect of Christianity that my, I might have and you might not have um, and it's, it's important for us to kind of like, you know, iron sharp and iron. We all need each other in order to grow. Um, and, and that's from the leadership to the pew. Um, we, all, we all need each other. So, verse 24, it says, And a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. And he was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. Uh, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things uh, concerning Jesus. Uh, though he knew only the baptism of John, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Um, I find it interesting that sometimes we take for granted uh, the United States. We take for granted the present day where the gospel has moved. Like, many people have heard the gospel, but it, it just, it's interesting just looking, putting it, putting ourselves in the first century context. It's still people that haven't heard the gospel, haven't heard that um, that Jesus even died. Um, all he knew was, he just knew uh, the baptism of John. He didn't know um, anything further than that. And he needed Priscilla and Aquila to come and instruct him and kind of give him more info and more context on what, what happened. Um, but I also find it interesting that in the way that Priscilla and Aquila approached him, um, they, they could have they approached him in front of everybody and embarrassed him. Um, in so many ways, this could have went wrong. Um, it's interesting because Apollos is an eloquent man. And what's interesting with people who speak well, um, with people who are great at arguing, sometimes you could win an argument and still be wrong. Um, my, <laughs> I don't want to ah, name names, my brother-in-law. He's so good at arguing. He could say, the paint on the walls are black. They clearly white, but he he talks so good, <laughs> and he'll make it sound so good, and he'll make a person believe something is false when or or is true when it's false or vice versa. Now, he just got that gift. He got the gift of gab. Uh, he really really good at what he do, and um, I'm looking and I'm seeing in the text you see Priscilla and Aquila. And he's eloquent. The scripture didn't point out that Priscilla and Aquila were eloquent or really good at speaking. They could have approached him, even taken him off to the side. And he could have, because of his pride, he could have said, he could have made it to where they were. He could have tried to twist the facts or, um, you know, point out different things or speak over their head. And he would have never got the full message of the gospel. But the way he responded to him, as we read further now, he accepts it, he utilizes it, and he uses it for the kingdom. But it could have went way wrong. Like um, like I say, um, I think the first thing they did right was they took him aside. Um, it's in the, in the scriptures that say, uh, if your brother offends you, go to him. Unfortunately, that's not typically how we operate. And, uh, you know, when somebody offends us or we don't like something they do, we go to our buddy and we have a conversation about that individual. And unbeknownst to the individual, you know, we could have went to them and the situation might have got resolved. People are different when you take them aside. Like, I know this from experience. It's like, even me, especially being men, you know, um, if you say something to a man, 
especially when like it's young women around, a lot of times that testosterone yeah. make you want to respond a certain type of way aggressively because you don't want to look angry. Or even amongst your peers, you don't want to look weak. You know what I mean? But when you take somebody aside, people typically respect you more based on my experience. And, you know, they're more open to hear what it is you got to say. But, you know, in different contexts and doing the opposite of what Priscilla and Aquila did, um, you know, it's, it's been a lot of cases that I went horribly wrong because of how we approach um, people and how we approach correction and the humility of Apollos. Like Apollos, like I say, he was eloquent. He could have let pride get away and he could have talked his way out of it. But we see in the text he didn't. And that's a great example of how we should be when somebody corrects us. Because it didn't say how old Priscilla and Aquila was. It didn't say how old Apollo was. Um, Priscilla and Aquila may have been younger or perhaps they were older, but he still accepted what they had to say and didn't dismiss it because, oh, y'all younger than me, what y'all know? Or y'all older than me, y'all old folk, y'all don't know nothing. And a lot of times we we will not take information or not respect the information or not just let the information speak for itself because of the person that's coming from. Oh, she a woman, what she know? Oh, he a man, of course a man say that. It shouldn't matter. The only thing that should matter is the information. And apparently, based on the text, none of those distinctions got in the way of the information getting related to Apollos. And, you know, um, thanks be to God, because, it, like I say, it could have went horribly wrong. Um, Unfortunately, yeah, you're right. And um, it's just, that's why, like, we just really got to move based on the Holy Spirit. Because if you're moving based on Harry or Alan, it, 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 can, it can go terribly, terribly. Yeah. Um, so I commend Priscilla and Aquila for the way they operate, both of them. Like, I think these are stellar examples for us to follow. Because um, it, it, it could have went horribly wrong. <laughs> hey, look who here. <laughs> um, so, verse 27. So, another thing that I wanted to point out too. Okay. The scripture pointed out how Apollos was accurate in his teaching. The scripture point out, pointed out how Priscilla and Aquila approached him and explained the gospel more accurately. Um, I think it really highlights the different um, kinds of evangelism. Because all we like really, all I hear um, typically is the death, burial, and resurrection. Some people, even in the text, he had some people might have had the death. We, I don't want to get too ahead in the text, but um, some people may not have heard about the death. Some people, some people may not have, they may not be really privy or had a full information about the resurrection. Maybe they know Jesus died on the cross, but maybe they don't know that he rose from the dead or what him rising from the dead means. So different examples here um, with Apollos, and then it's going to be a group of, uh, um, in chapter 19 that Paul visits that they didn't hear about, um, they didn't even know it was the Holy Spirit, but I don't want to jump too far ahead, but 
it never occurred to me until more recently that, wow, like sometimes, like, especially in the United States, especially with black folk, we just assume, oh, they know the gospel, they know he died on the roads. Do they know? You know what I mean? Do they? Like, we, we, we make assumptions. I make assumptions. I don't want to, you know, indict y'all on because I don't know y'all. I, I don't, I'm not with y'all every day. I, I don't know y'all hearts. But a lot of times, you know, again, the devil is a liar. Oh, they know. They know. They know what it is. They, they don't need you to break it down. How do I know it? You know what I'm saying? Like, how do they, uh, the gospel is so deep. Maybe they don't know what the resurrection means. Because, hey, Lazarus rose from the dead. Um, Elijah rose, you know, he he rose a few people from the dead in the Old Testament. People in the Old Testament came, you know, got resurrected. So that's not a new concept biblically. But Jesus' resurrection was different. Yeah. Jesus, when Jesus rose from the dead, he don't die no more. And his death paid something. But so those specifics are important when it comes to the gospel. So, you know, here Priscilla and Aquila. They explain the specifics about um, the gospel to Apollos. Paul does it later in chapter 19 with a group of Christians. And so, like, I think that's something for us to keep in mind is that, like, there is different. Sometimes it's not, it, it may not necessarily be a need for the whole gospel, but certain parts of it needs to be broken down and explained. Um, and we shouldn't assume that, we should assume that no one knows. Because um, if 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 we were to just assume that people knew it, why would God tell us to, you know, preach the gospel to all nations? So, you know, assumption is dangerous in that context. Um, so that's something I wanted to highlight. And another thing uh, that I wanted to highlight uh, is further down uh, after uh, he gets. The gospel explained more accurately. Uh, 27, he said, and when he wished to cross uh, uh, Achaia, uh, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those uh, through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing them by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus, by the scriptures. It's interesting. We're talking about the different types of um, evangelism. Like, so he was proficient in the scriptures and he was able to argue, refute, correct individuals from the scriptures. Um, but then we read in verse in chapter 17 of Acts where Paul, he didn't really use the scriptures when he was in the Areopagus. He used what he saw. He used what was a part of their culture. And he used those aspects, but he still preached the gospel. He still preached the information about what happened, what it meant because he rose, because he died, um, and why he died. But he used, he didn't necessarily use the scripture because it's just one another aspect of knowing your audience. You know what I'm saying? Because the Greeks, they didn't know the scriptures. They, they might have heard of the scriptures. Um, some of them might know it because of, you know, the proximity to the Jewish, you know, synagogues and Jews who lived in the city. But, you know, they wouldn't, have, they may not have known it enough to really, you know, as much as like a Jew would. So he didn't go that route with preaching the gospel. He preached the gospel from a perspective of, from their perspective, from a perspective they will understand. And I think another thing too in the text, the text highlights that um, Apollos was eloquent. And it's, it highlighted it, that he's eloquent to say that everybody's not eloquent. But the scripture didn't say, well, only preach the gospel if you're eloquent, if you can speak well, if you're good with words. It just told all of us to preach the gospel. And it's kind of, it's kind of comforting because it removes a standard that sometimes we put on ourselves to think we, it has to sound real good, it has to sound real catchy, or however we, we might think that we should present it. 
It just needs to be understandable. It just, Paul said, I'd rather say five words of understanding, right? 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. What good is it if the person that you're speaking to don't understand what you're saying? So it's, it's all about, you know, again, and it's, and it's not putting other people or measuring ourselves up to other people. Well, I can't speak like Apollos. Well, you can, and that's fine. And you're not less than, and you're still valuable in the kingdom if you're not as good with words as Apollos. I'm using him as an example, but fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. You know, it's other people that you know personally that might be able to articulate that way. And that's fine, but you don't have to. You, God gave us everything that we need, you know, to do his work. And everybody don't have the same gifts. Everybody don't have the same specialties. And that's okay. And that doesn't make you less than. That just, you know, we all different. And I think it's just important for us to operate off our differences. Because we wouldn't be a church if we all the same. We should be one, but not necessarily not the same. We not the same. Male, female distinctions, age distinctions, um, you know, social economic distinctions. Nobody's the same. Somebody might can't talk a lick, but guess what? I got a hundred thousand dollars. You know what I mean? Guess what? Hey, that hundred thousand dollars can help the kingdom. You know what I'm saying? I might be able to preach an amazing sermon, but I don't have a hundred thousand. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's okay because I'm playing my part. I like the I love Donatos on the box that say every piece is important. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. Every piece is important. And no piece is above another piece. We all want in Christ and we all can make a difference um, for the kingdom. But we just have to, you know, understanding that fact, it's like, for me, that, that's like crazy comforting because it's like, okay, I don't have to be, you know, a Benson. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't have an education that he do. And that's fine because I just operate the way I can operate. He operates in the way he operates. And we all together, we strong. Go ahead. Uh, we are, well, you know, it, it back to, to that we are a body with many parts. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And each part has a function. Mm -hmm. And one part cannot do without the other part. So, which makes, builds up the body of the Christ of the church. And as you get, like I say, as you get older, you might feel less adequate. I'm not saying you, but I'm saying might. As you, I mean, anything. Oh, I, I might have used to have a whole bunch of money, and I ain't got no money no more. I ain't important no more. But God can use you at any level. And, you know, looking at Apollos, looking at Priscilla, looking at Aquila, looking at Paul back in um, chapter 17, the way he spoke to the people in Areopagus. Um, you know, Apollos is a great speaker. Um, I'm not sure Paul was learned, but it never said he was great at speaking. It was some implications, some places where he might not have been that good of a speaker, but he was highly educated. But look how God used Paul. Look how God used, what is it, 1 Corinthians, to talk about how they was creating distinctions between Peter, Paul, and Apollos. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of um, Peter. But it's like, no, we all won. It's not about, you know, he he do his part, he do his part, she do her part. We all play a part, we all play a role. And, you know, no no member of the body can look down on another member of the body as if, oh, you're inadequate, or you're not good enough, or you're better. Because all of those viewpoints are false biblically when you look at the scriptures. The scriptures don't teach that. Amen. Um, All of those gifts are important because of, they are of the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what we should be depending on too when mm -hmm. we like when we you know evangelizing. Again, my my um, downfall is overthink. I overthink. I overthink, and it don't take all that. I do that all the time. It don't take all that. It just don't. And I I think it do sometimes. But it don't. Uh, no, it's just overthinking in the beginning of the lesson. <laughs> but we ain't gonna talk about that. But yeah, sometimes you just 
you know, he gonna use what you got. You know, like I always, always say, that's all I got. I give y'all what I got. That's it. I, ain't, I, ain't. I can't give y'all what, what I ain't got. You know what I'm saying? But uh, let me go on to um, uh, chapter 19, verse 1. And it's, uh, and it reads, go ahead. Also, um, Jesus and about the gospel. Generally, if they're Jews and you know they're familiar with the scripture, then you prove that Jesus is the Christ by the known scripture. In John 5, 39, Jesus, they searched the scripture for it and think he has eternal life, but they testify of me. So you want to point to all the types and, uh, and pictures of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. But the Bible starts off, and, and, and generally with the Greek, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Gentile, when they're not familiar with the scripture, then you start with creation, and you take them from creation to prove that Jesus is the Christ. Yeah. And that's like, again, that just rolls back to knowing your audience. And that's sometimes, uh, again, I miss that a lot. Just, just know your audience. Like, you know, you, you're going to approach it a different way with different individuals that, that you encounter. And um, I just love that idea of he used the scriptures, you know, with the Jews to refute them because it, like, he did it every time Paul went to a city, he went to the synagogues and he did it from the scriptures. All the scriptures that they had was the Old Testament. Amen. So I like that because it's proven even in the beginning, in the genesis of Christianity, that Christ was in the scriptures. Christ was in the Old Testament. Oh, okay. Like it's just because it, it wasn't just this, it wasn't just that one instance where Apollos just did it to the Jews. Every city that Paul went in, he went to the synagogue and he reasoned with the Jews. He reasoned with the Jews. That Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus was the Christ. So it just proves that, like, you know, like Jews say, like, like they reinterpret the Old Testament and try to make it all. Oh, that wasn't Jesus, um, you know, uh, no, that, it was talking about something else. But you got these people from the very beginning, they using the scripture to roll to Emmaus. Um, Jesus went from the Old Testament. And showed that Jesus was the Christ. The Christ was to come. The Christ was promised. Um, what he would have to suffer. What he would have to endure. And it's just reassurance that it's not just, oh, you know, the disciples wrote the Old Testament, the New Testament. And these are just their, like, ideas that they just generated from, from nothing. Or they just made this stuff up. No, it, it stems from, and even in a lot of the letters in the New Testament, in, in many of the letters, they use an Old Testament text and, you know, they show in that, you know, Jesus is the Christ from the Old Testament text. So, it's just reassuring that it's not just in the New Testament. Jesus is not just in the New Testament. He's all throughout the Old Testament. And, Amen. Yeah. And then it says, uh, verse 1, he said, and it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So this is what I was alluding to back before. Um, you know, it's, it's still pieces that people hadn't heard yet. And like, this is so different from now because soon as something happened now, we instantly know it, but it just really proves how slow information moved back then as opposed to today mm -hmm. because this is like, you know, maybe 15 years removed um, of Jesus' death. So it's like, dude, 15 years and everybody ain't heard yet? But again, we so caught up in you know, the internet age, cell phones, everybody having a computer in their pocket, like, how, 
That's what I should know by now. Like, no, they, you know, uh, Peter, Paul didn't have a podcast. You know what I mean? He, he didn't have uh, that. He, he didn't have those resources that we have today. And it's just interesting. And I like that he said, "Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? Not that you had to go do some stuff and uh -huh. Uh -huh. belief." is what saves, not doing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have a works-based salvation. Um, we have a faith-based salvation. And it's not a works, let's get man should boast. And it's just, this is more confirmation of that fact and that ideology, well, really that theology that we believe that is grace through faith, uh, not of works. It's, uh, you know, other denominations, may believe like that and uh, really every other world religion is about what you do but we the only ones just Christians who believe it's about what somebody else did Amen. Yeah, and that's, that's just a radically different theology than any other you know Islam uh, Buddhism uh, Hinduism no, nobody it's always about you know Hinduism you do good this time, you get reincarnated into something better. And you get reincarnated if you do, and eventually you reach nirvana. But, you know, with us, it's like Jesus died on the cross. Jesus rose from the dead. Um, and because of that fact, we say because there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be, somebody had to die um, because that's the way Jesus ended death. You know what I'm saying? And that's, it's just reassuring here because, again, like I like the idea that it conveys right here. It's not, they didn't do anything but believe to receive the Holy Spirit. You know, because you can't nothing about the Holy Spirit. Um, you can't follow the Word of God without the Holy Spirit. You can follow it, but your motivation will be lost. Um, it won't make any difference. It won't make, because like you, so you have people in other religions who are good, good from a world's perspective, your, your most scariest text, that's scary. I've cast out demons in your name. Right. <laughs> Father, we did this in your name. I never knew you. I never knew you. Right. Well, how can that be? Because it's not about what you do, it's why you do it. Mm -hmm. And really, it stems from the Holy Spirit prompting you to follow the word, to do what the word says. Yeah. And that's why, like, you know, when it's important for us to not judge externally outside the church because all they can do is what they program to do. They they can't they don't have the Holy Spirit to get them the power to stop sin. We do, so we can look at one another and say, "Hey, brother, hey, sister, um, you know you shouldn't have did that." Um, so that's what I got out of that uh, specific. And I'm going to go ahead and stop there. And that's all I got.